Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. Will today be the day that we find out where Brian Koberger was at the time of the alleged murders? Scott Peterson is back in court, if only for a minute. George Kelly trial, it's wrapping up. One more makes four for Rex Heuerman. Don't point dangerous objects at people because guess what? They may point a dangerous object back at you. What have I said repeatedly? about adults wanting to hang out with kids. Another example, a criminal defense lawyer finds herself in need of some representation and our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, leave me a comment below, hit that little bell for notifications, and remember you can always listen to us on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Let's go ahead and get to the uh, docket for April 17th of 2024. And first on the docket, yes, that's right, the case of Brian Koberger. Will we find out where he was? Well, that's right. The defense team has until the end of today to file a notice that it intends to present an alibi in the defense of Brian Koberger. As you may recall, last summer, the defense said that Koberger's alibi was that he had been driving around alone in the middle of the night at the time of the alleged murders. Now, obviously, there's murders, but he's accused of it, so we got to give him the presumption of innocence. So he's accused of committing the murders. Anyway, the, pro the prosecutor at that time, Bill Thompson, he said that the alibi was a little too vague. Judge John Judge agreed and said that um, it's not really an alibi. Now, an actual alibi includes the specific place or places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense. It must include the name and the addresses of the witnesses upon whom the defendant intends to rely upon to establish such alibi. And obviously, if the defense puts Brian Coburn on the stand to say that, well, I was alone at home in my dorm room, snug in my bed like a bug, it's difficult to say if that would be an alibi. Certainly, only he could testify uh, to that. Wouldn't really require notice, in my humble opinion. We've discussed alibis before. In my years of practice, I've never had one that worked. Frankly, if there was something that there was an alibi, it says, hey, you got the wrong person, you presented that information up front, prosecutors checked it out immediately, and they said, oop, you're right, we have the wrong guy. At trial, never had it worked. In fact, I've endorsed it many times over the years. Don't think I've ever called an alibi witness because they're always a little suspect and their story doesn't seem to make sense because once you endorse them, the other side gets to go talk with them and their story just doesn't seem to make sense and it falls apart. So, and as an officer of the court, you cannot put on perjured testimony. You can't do that. Um, sometimes questionable whether it's perjured or just faulty memory, uh, but if you have a good faith basis that it's been created or fabricated and not truthful, you cannot do that whatsoever. The main issue in the Brian Koberger case is the prosecution has to prove identity. In every criminal case, the prosecution must prove identity. They have to prove that it was the defendant, not someone that looked like him, not someone using his identity, not somebody that maybe was at that apartment at some other time, not somebody who lent somebody their K-bar uh, that may have their DNA on it. They have to say that it was, in fact, the defendant, not someone who looked like him, not anybody else. Alibi is to show, hey, couldn't have been me. I was with my, my wife, my significant other, and they're going to call them to the stand. Once again, if that's the case, it's usually going to be um, checked out beforehand. Had a, had a situation once where a guy was accused of robbing a bank. He goes, that's impossible. I couldn't have done that because I was at an ATM on the other side of town at or about that time. Sure enough, it checked out case went away, right? So if it hasn't made the case go away just as of yet, I don't think we're going to have an alibi. That's my educated guess. Now, Judge John Judge is still mulling over whether to allow the defense to continue their surveying of potential 
uh, jurors to determine how many of the jury pool may have been tainted by excessive media information. Hopefully we'll get that ruling sooner rather than later. Now, obviously, uh, Mr. Brian Koberger has pled not guilty to the murders of Zana Kernodal, Etha Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves. No trial date has, in fact, been set yet. Next on the docket, Scott Peterson. Very short court appearance, and I mean short court appearance. Uh, he appeared in court to, once again, try to overturn his conviction for the killing of his wife and unborn son. Now, the lawyers for the L.A. Innocent Project, and in no way connected with the National Innocence Project, began representing Scott Peterson to have details that have been sealed uh, regarding the ongoing case. Now, the, the hearing only lasted a couple of minutes because they determined that what they were asking to be sealed had already been sealed. So needless to say, there wasn't a whole lot to do. But Peterson's new attorneys are claiming that a van found on fire a day after a burglary near the Peterson's residence had a bloodstained mattress in it that could be related to the alleged murders. The van was found about a mile from the family home, and the L.A. Innocence Project uh, also claims it has evidence that the van did not have a mattress in it before it was stolen and before Lacey Peterson's slain. Now, this nonprofit is arguing that Peterson's rights were violated as uh, evidence will prove his innocence and that this exculpatory innocence was withheld. For those who aren't familiar with this case because it is so old, Lacey Peterson vanished on Christmas Eve in 2002, a month before she was due to give birth. The prosecutors alleged and proved that Scott Peterson strangled or suffocated his pregnant wife before then wrapping her in a tarp, fastening her to anchors, and dropping her body in the San Francisco Bay. Now, Scott Peterson, who claimed he was fishing in Berkeley when his pregnant wife vanished, was ultimately arrested in San Diego County and coincidentally had $15,000 in cash and appeared as though he was leaving the area. Now, Scott Peterson uh, went to trial back in 2004 and was sentenced to death. However, the California Supreme Court overturned the death sentence in that particular case after it was determined the jurors who disagreed with the death penalty, but they were still willing to impose it if they were found to find that it was appropriate, well, they were being unfairly dismissed from the case, and therefore you had not a properly uh, qualified death jury in that case. Therefore, the, uh, the court uh, reversed that situation. Now, there's also issues surrounding prejudicial misconduct after a uh, domestic violence victim was uh, put on the jury as well, but the judge dismissed that uh, as uh, basically didn't, didn't make a difference. So back in 2021, Peterson was uh, resentenced to life in prison without parole. And later that year, the uh, judge denied his bid for a new trial based upon the uh, juror issues. So we'll continue to follow this case. Scott Peterson, who's now, I think, 51, will continue to be with us forever, I'm sure. But you know how I feel about post-conviction matters. Obviously, we don't want innocent people in prison if they didn't commit the crime. But at a certain point, it's got to be on the defense to come up with some substantial evidence to prove actual innocence of their client. So far, I've seen nothing that would lead me to believe that uh, they got the wrong guy in the Peterson case. But hey, if you think I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Next, the George Kelly trial. Yes, we were bringing you this trial, but then the uh, court stopped streaming it. Now we put the video up on a daily basis. So the prosecution has rested their case in the second degree murder trial of George Kelly, and Kelly is charged with recklessly shooting a Mexican national crossing his ranch. Now, Mr. Kelly's lawyers uh, have been arguing to show that investigators thought that Mr. Kelly was guilty from the very beginning and focused their investigation solely on him. Mr. Kelly's attorneys say he heard a shot and he fired a shot over the head of a group of five men who had rifles and were carrying some large packages. But the lead detective on the case says there's no evidence of a five-person group, nor is there any evidence that anyone other than Mr. Kelly fired a gun that day. The detectives say he thinks Kelly deliberately aimed towards the man who ultimately died. 
Well, the defense attorneys suggest that George Kelly did not fire the shot that killed Gabriel Suen Butema. She suggested that the victims uh, was involved in smuggling and that other smugglers shot him to steal money and drugs in which he was transporting. Now, uh, Jorge Aniza is the lead detective, and he told the uh, attorneys on the stand that he believes Kelly deliberately pointed the gun, and there's nothing to back up the suggestion that bandits are the real ones who shot the victim. He said there is no other shot involved in this. The victim sustained a serious injury from a high-powered rifle, an AK-47 rifle, with a trajectory directly from Mr. Kelly's residence. Now, investigators say they found nine shell casings outside Kelly's house in a pattern consistent with shots being fired toward the dead man. Now, there is no ballistic test to match the fatal bullet to Kelly's gun, and the bullet went through the victim and has never been recovered. Now, a Border Patrol agent testified that Kelly called him and said he was being shot and that uh, he was shooting back. But the detective says uh, Kelly never told him that he shot his rifle at all until the detective was a half uh, hour into a formal interrogation with him. Now that the prosecution has rested the case, Mr. Kelly's lawyers are presenting their defense. They have called David Hathaway. He is the Santa Cruz County's elected sheriff. Hathaway and one of his detectives went into Mexico to interview a witness who say he saw the dead man shot and killed. Now, Judge uh, Thomas Fink, who's been a little sporadic on this particular case, is expecting the arguments, the closing arguments in this case on Thursday. Obviously, the jury would be beginning deliberation shortly after that. Next, Rex Heuerman. One more makes four. That's right. The Gilgo Beach murder suspect Rex Heuerman appeared in court Wednesday on Long Island after being charged earlier this year. Now, Mr. Heuerman, the architect, was initially arrested outside of his Manhattan office in July for the murder of three sex workers. He was later charged with the murder of a fourth victim. Now, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello are all known as the Gilgo Four. Now, Hurman has entered a not guilty plea to the most recent charge. And in a uh, very short uh, conference, it was determined that Mr. Hurman and his attorneys would be back in court back on June 18th. No trial date set. Now, quick recap for those who aren't familiar with the Gilgo Four case, D- DNA from a discarded pizza crust and burner phone uh, is evidence that tied him to the three sex workers, Melissa, Megan, and Amber. Mr. Heuerman was formally charged in the killing of uh, Brainerd Barnes uh, months after being labeled as the prime suspect in her death when he was arrested in July for the deaths of the three other women. Now, a hair found in the buckle of this belt that is alleged to have bound Brainerd Barnes is said to be linked to Mr. Heerman, and his daughter's discarded energy drink taken from a garbage can also matched DNA profiles. Now, the bodies of the Gilgo Four were located within a quarter mile of one another near the Gilgo Beach in December of 2010. Now, the deaths of 11 people whose remains were found back in 2010 and 2011 have long um, given the investigators a, a headache because they've been unable to solve them. And most of the victims were young women who had been sex workers. Several of the bodies were found near the remote town of Gilgo Beach on the southern shore of Long Island. Now, determining who killed them and why, like I said, has uh, caused great stress through the police department and detectives who have worked on the case for years. No arrests have been made in the deaths of the six others uh, found near Gilgo Beach, but the grand jury with the assistance of the prosecutor, are continuing their investigation, and they'll see if more charges are brought against Mr. Heuerman. Next, don't point dangerous objects at other people, because guess what? They may fire them at you and shoot you, and it could be self-defense. Gunfire broke out as a um, man entered a gas station and uh, wound up killing one person and injuring a private security guard. The shootout took place at a Sunoco gas station, and the armed uh, security guard was on duty inside the store when another armed man walked into the location with a gun. 
The suspect confronted the guard after apparently having some sort of altercation, wait for it, regarding a uh, parked barbecue truck. I know I bring firearms to all my discussions with people about their parking circumstances. Anyway, the surveillance video shows the moment the armed suspect walked into the gas station, confronted the security guard before gunfire erupted. Now, police believe that the gunfire was exchanged between both men and um, it all took place with inside the store. Now, the security guard was a licensed security guard and was permitted to carry a uh, firearm, and that's why he was working at the gas station. He was shot in the leg. Now, the uh, other man who was not so lucky was shot multiple times in the face and in the legs, and he died at the hospital. I'm going to guess it was the ones to the face that got him, not the ones in the leg, but you never know. He could have just bled out. Anyway, uh, no charge has been filed yet against the security guard, nor should they. Next, what have I always said about adults that want to hang out with other people's kids? Yes, proven right once again. Not that I'm looking to be right. I wish I was wrong. But unfortunately, these cases continue to come up again and again and again. So a retired teacher of more than four decades is accused of having sexual contact with a young boy and investigators believe there may be additional victims that may come forward. <sighs> I am shocked. Well, please meet Kenneth Steiniger. We will give him the presumption of innocence, even though this 68-year-old man who has uh, taught and served as a Boy Scout leader in Pennsylvania is accused of doing some mean things. That's right, he allegedly sexually assaulted a student between 2018 and 2020 when the child was between the ages of 11 and 13. Now, the district attorney announced it Tuesday and they stated in their press conference, when an adult entrusted with the care and well-being of children engages in such conduct, the affront to society is even deeper. It's both heartbreaking and deeply disturbing that such an individual would take advantage of a vulnerable child. Uh, is anybody surprised by that? I'm not. What have I told you? right? I don't care if it's a burglar or somebody that wants to go do harm to young children. They look for weak and vulnerable people. That's what they do. So don't be weak. Don't be vulnerable in any aspect of your life, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, needless to say, the school uh, that he worked at is a boarding school for children with families headed by a single parent or guardian. And uh, sadly, they believe that given the defendant's long tenure working with children, it's very likely that additional victims will come forward. What have I said, ladies and gentlemen, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my kids, right? Um, I love my kids. And when they were younger, I, I mean, I, I loved them. They were great. They were fun to hang out with. But the last thing I ever wanted to do was hang out with somebody else's small children, okay? That just defies complete logic. All right, never, never let my kids do sleepovers. I know, terrible parent, but people do what they can't do at home, so they have sleepovers. Don't get me wrong. I know, I got to sleep over when I was a kid and we snuck out, that's what we did, okay? And then I started doing this job and I'm like, nope, no more sleepovers. Um, you know, that guy that maybe works at the pizza joint that's, you know, like 50 years old, that lives in his mother's basement. Why is he working at those places where all the kids come? Hmm. Could it be because <gasps> that's where the kids are? Yeah. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we haven't plugged this in a while, but yes, we are still associated with CrimeTalkSearch.com, okay? And if there's somebody coming into your life, you need to do a background check on them. So go to CrimeTalkSearch.com. It is a subscription service, yes, but you can cancel at any time. But I'm telling you, we use this in our law firm on nearly a daily basis, just running things down because it's less expensive than having a private investigator do it. And frankly, sometimes we get better results than what the private investigator gets. So if someone is coming into your life or if somebody just gives you that weird feeling and your spidey senses start to tingle, check them out, all right? Information is power. Who knows? Could save your life or maybe that of a loved one. Next, a criminal defense attorney is in need of some representation. Listen to this. A North Carolina criminal defense attorney found herself on the wrong side of the law when she allegedly assaulted a woman and then she faked a seizure when the cops arrived. So 
Police from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department responded to an, ass an assault shortly before noon on Monday, and it was at the law office of a 53-year-old uh, Mary Leeser Rogers. When the police arrived, police found a woman uh, with a bloodied, scratched-up face. According to Rogers, the attorney in the arrest affidavit, the, uh, the victim said Rogers accused her of having a personal relationship with a client who had been at the office earlier in the day. The victim told officers that Rogers wants to have a sexual relationship with her, but she has rebuffed Rogers' attempts. Now, Rogers began arguing with the victim and cursing at the victim, and that's when the assault allegedly took place. Now, the uh, victim allegedly alleged that uh, the attorney uh, punched her five times in the face. Officers placed the attorney, Miss Rogers, under arrest, and as the officers walked to the patrol car, she reportedly kicked the officers in the leg. She then spit in the face of another police officer. She also uh, apparently laid down in the patrol car and refused to sit up. And when officers tried to uh, sit her up, she allegedly forced her way out of the patrol car and onto the ground. Apparently, the uh, suspect was screaming and cursing during this time and caused the scene that many people came out of their offices to see what the heck was going on, wrote the officer. And the officers believed that uh, she was having a seizure, so they took her to the hospital. When they got there, though, she allegedly told the hospital staff that well, she was just faking it. She also spit on the medics, according to the officers as well. Now, the police uh, took her to the jail and booked her in for simple assault charges um, on a government official or an employee and two counts of malicious conduct by a prisoner. She has since posted her bond, and guess what? She can't be reached, and neither can her attorney. Now, obviously, we got to give everybody the presumption of innocence. However, let's just say not exactly professional conduct. That's for certain. Um, and the things they teach you, right? You want to keep your law license, a couple of things. One, communicate with your client. Keep them in the loop. Let them know what's going on. Always do it. Put it in writing for your own protection. Two, um, don't steal your client's money. And third, don't sleep with your clients. If you do that, you're going to get disbarred or you're going to have a disgruntled spouse, partner, friend, or whatever come up to the office. Why would you do that? I don't get it. Obviously, I, I hope it's just a mere allegation, and maybe the attorney, Miss Rogers, was having a really, really bad day. But as an officer of the court, she should know better. We'll give the presumption of innocence, ladies and gentlemen. She knows better. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. We haven't had any food crime in a while, so, well, today's the day. Please meet Joseph Tresselt. He was allegedly making a pizza the other evening when he confronted his roommate, Elvis Singleton. And apparently while preparing the uh, pizza, Mr. Tresselt uh, stated that Singleton started making sounds like coughing in a way that was trying to irritate him on purpose. Anyway, Mr. Tresselt uh, also reported hearing voices telling him how to make the pizza. Anyway, getting quite perturbed, not sure by the coughing or the voices, Mr. Tressel threw a piece of dough on the floor and then threw it again at the victim, striking Mr. Singleton in the head while he was seated at the dining room table with his back to Mr. Tressel. Is there no justice in the world? Anyway, the police ultimately responded. There was no visible signs of bruising, probably because it was pizza dough. And um, as it related, Mr. Singleton um, couldn't show any injuries. However, however, Mr. Trussell reportedly admitted to tossing the pizza dough because Mr. Singleton was making that coughing noise and he didn't like it. Well, because of that admission, duh, he was arrested for misdemeanor battery and booked into the county jail where he's still there on $1,100 bond. Now, what's interesting is that Mr. Tressel was also charged with criminal mischief for allegedly breaking a piece of furniture in Mr. Singleton's room as well. So this is a multi-room criminal. You've heard of multi-jurisdictional criminals? No, multi-room. Anyway, guess what? Mr. Tressel cannot have any contact with Mr. Singleton and can't return back to the apartment that they shared with each other. 
It's also a little interesting that Mr. Tressel was busted for allegedly assaulting Mr. Singleton in the past. And according to that arrest paperwork, Mr. Tressel said that Singleton's coughing noise caused him to punch the victim in the face. Prosecutors ultimately dismissed that case and didn't pursue it. But yes, look, he was given a break and he did it again. Now, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Singleton, if you've got a cough, maybe you need to check it out. Because um, frankly, it's very irritating to Mr. Tressel at least. And um, you may want to get a new roommate. Just, just saying, you, you, you do you. Okay, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next time. And remember, yes, the Constitution matters. Mm -hmm.